Okay, thank you all for coming to our last faculty lecture um, of the semester. Uh, before we get started, uh, I've got a sign-up list here. If you would like to get uh, alerts for the next um, faculty lecture, uh, either by email, or if you don't have email, um, if you can provide your physical address, I will send out uh, an email with a list of the topics for that semester, and that will go out um, sometime in early August. And we don't have our lineup um, solidified yet for the fall, so it should be um, a fun one. So I have that here. Um, so you put your name um, and your email list, email address. If you put your email, uh, you'll also get notifications the week before uh, the next talk. Um, if not, um, if you just have a your physical address, um, then you'll just get one um, letter on the beginning of the semester. Okay, um, with that, I'd like to um, welcome uh, Dr. Ben Hanau. Um, to talk about controlling um, illegal migration. Okay, good, thank you. So a few observa observations first. I noticed that everyone's stacked to this side of the room. That's exactly what my students do. It's fascinating to me. And then people kind of moved over here. So hopefully that doesn't mean that all of you are, are, are waiting for a moment to leave. Um, <laughs> there, someone brought to my attention, a, a former student, a current student, um, brought to my attention that there is a, a documentary that's going to be showing on May 5th called Sin País or Without a Country uh, and it's about um, Sam and Elida who were they're from Guatemala and they're in the United States for 20 years uh, under protected status and then Guatemala is now seen as a safe place so a lot of people are sent back home or they're asked to uh, be removed from the country they're deported and so um, I haven't seen this myself but I know it's a theme that intersects with a lot of uh, immigration trends within the valley given the Guatemalan community so people might be interested in this um, because I assume uh, already noticing that you guys act like students. Um, I'm not going to pass it out yet because that means that you'll look at it while I'm presenting. So I'll, I'll leave it up here for you guys. Um, please, please know that it's there. Uh, I'll try and remind people towards the end. So I'm going to start off with George Carlin. Uh, you guys might wonder what it has to do with migration. Um, as you'll see, it has absolutely nothing to do with migration, but pay attention anyways. In the First World War, that condition was called shell shock. Simple, honest, direct language, two syllables, shell shock. Almost sounds like the guns themselves. That was 70 years ago. Then a whole generation went by, and the Second World War came along, and the very same combat condition was called battle fatigue. Four syllables now, takes a little longer to say, doesn't seem to hurt as much. Fatigue is a nicer word than shock. Show shock. Battle fatigue. <laughs> then we had the war in Korea in 1950. Madison Avenue was riding high by that time. And the very same combat condition was called operational exhaustion. <laughs> hey, we're up to eight syllables now. And the humanity has been squeezed completely out of the phrase. It's totally sterile now. <coughs> Operational exhaustion. Sounds like something that might happen to your car. <laughs> then, of course, came the war in Vietnam, which has only been over for about 16 or 17 years. And thanks to the lies and deceit surrounding that war, I guess it's no surprise that the very same condition was called post-traumatic stress disorder. Still eight syllables, but we... Okay, I'm going to end that. Notice there's something amazing about this video. He never cussed, not once. That's incredible for George Carlin. Um, George Carlin, he's playing with this idea of euphemisms, right? And so one of the things that I'll ask you to consider through, throughout this discussion is the implications that illegal has in terms of the way we think about individuals. And so um, think as we kind of go through this presentation, as I walk you through the presentation, think about legal immigrants, think about undocumented immigrants, think about this, this concept that, that perhaps gives us a better understanding of why people leave. Uh, poor people looking for opportunity, right? And so think about the, the connotations um, that the words that we use have and the implications that those have, because that's, that's what I'll essentially be asking you to consider um, throughout. That's my daughter. She's trying to participate. Um, <laughs> okay. So controlling illegal immigration. Um, I use illegal in the sense that 
It refers to a term that we're currently using in politics. Right now we're going through uh, debates within Senate specifically concerning the possibility of immigration reform. And so one of the questions becomes, should we allow the estimated 20, uh, well they estimate between 12 and 20 million people are living in the United States without um, citizenship or a path to citizenship. And so the question concerns, should those people have a path to citizenship? And what I'll be looking at in this presentation is an alternative approach, that is, what role does economic uh, development play in the idea of controlling immigration. So the basic, I had this thing working earlier. Let's see. You just have to do it the first time. You have to do it the first time, okay. Um, <coughs> so the basic argument that I'll be proposing throughout the presentation is that the best way and perhaps the only way to really control migration or immigration in, in the case of the United States is to support meaningful development in migrant sending regions. And so um, initially I'll go through uh, a history of illegal immigration in the United States or undocumented immigration. Um, it'll be somewhat comical, so I'll keep you, I'll keep you interested at least initially. Uh, I'll give you a review of migration theory, so looking at kind of the reasons that um, help us understand why people leave um, and why they come to certain areas. Then we'll look at immigration trends from Mexico, specifically my research focuses on Mexico, and so um, after looking at some of the recent trends from Mexico, we'll then look at some of the extent research or the existing research concerning uh, migration and development in Mexico, so looking how we can start to understand those trends through looking at development specifically and its relationship with people leaving Mexico. And then at the very end, I'll, I'll present some of my research concerning uh, the, the relationship between remittances, so cash transfers that people send back to Mexico um, from the United States and migration trends and development in Mexico. So I'll come back to this overview several times just so that people are clear um, about where I'm going. So what do we know about illegal immigration? It's nothing new, right? Um, these are the individuals that come initially. We refer to them in history as colonizers. We refer to them as um, individuals that were coming to look for opportunity. And today, we see a very similar trend. That is, we see individuals leaving places for political prosecution, for economic needs, or because of social networks. They already have people they know, perhaps in the United States. Um, not that different, but uh, illegal immigration or people coming without documents is something that is not new. Um, more comical stuff. <laughs> Controlling immigration is not new either. And so perhaps in the United States, early on before the United States was the United States, the natives were not speaking of guest worker programs or amnesty programs or building walls, but they were certainly considering whether or not they wanted these newcomers to integrate into their communities. These conversations were being had. Uh, we may not have great documentation about which tribes were willing to accept or not accept, but it's true that different tribes have different positions on this, just as people today have different positions on whether or not we should allow people paths to citizenship. Early xeno uh, xenophobia, you can think of Benjamin Franklin here. So I bring in a quote from Franklin. He says, quote, why should Pennsylvania founded by English become a colony of aliens? Note the early use, even before the United States becomes the United States of aliens, referring to foreigners as, as people literally that don't have the right to be here um, almost by birth, who will shortly be so numerous as to Germanize us instead of anglifying them and will never adopt our language or customs any more than they acquire our complexion. Uh, note that he's actually drawing a, a different, he's differentiating between the complexion of English people and Germans. All my descendants are Germans, but most people would see me as white today. Um, but Franklin apparently would not have. So um, I'm glad that I was born in, in this century, in, or the, the previous century, and not in his century. Um, but note that he's talking about things that are very common to the immigration debate today. Language, customs, complexion, uh, places that people are coming from, in this case Germany. There was a real fear that Germans might have such an influence to actually change the official language of the country. And he's talking early on about this legal status, aliens. So fast forwarding to the United States today um, and, and thinking of that kind of historic context uh, that, that began even before um, during the colonial period, it's interesting to look at the way in which we deal with uh, undocumented immigrants or illegal immigrants today. Um, in the last 10 years, there's been a great deal of deportations and it's cost a lot of money. In this, and we'll look at, we'll look at the cost here in a second, but this helps us kind of see, break down criminal deportations by non-criminal deportations. Don't get too confused by the differentiation because criminal deportation could be uh, driving too fast. It could be running into someone without insurance. So criminal don't, it would be wrong to think of all of the criminal deportations as someone uh, committing a homicide, for example. So uh, there's a great deal of, there's a great increase taking place during the last 10 years, more than doubles. 
and you can see um, that by 2012, we are deporting around 400,000 individuals per year. So one might imagine that there's a lot of costs associated with doing that. And it turns out that there are. So between Customs and Border Patrol and Immigration and Customs Enforcement, um, in the previous 2009-2010, we're spending almost $18 billion per year on those activities. And a lot of that has to do with building up the border, um, so the border wall, and also with processing people out of the country, which can take three to six months or even longer. So people are held in detention centers. The federal government transfers that money to the, descent, the private descent, uh, detention centers in places like Arizona and Nevada. And then those individuals eventually are processed out of the country. But in the meantime, the bill, of course, is passed on to taxpayers. Um, all of this, this data here, by the way, comes from the Department of Homeland Security. So if it, someone are interested in, in receiving more of this data, um, I could point you towards it or you could go directly to their website. So th the comparative costs are of interest. In the fiscal year 2012, the C so the Border, uh, the border Control and, and, and Customs, um, ICE Immigration Control and Enforcement, and U.S. Visit, together combined to spend $18 billion. In the same year, you can look at all of these institutions, so FBI, DEA, Secret Service, U.S. Marshals, Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, combined to spend $14.4 billion. And so less is being spent on the bottom than on the top. And this is, this is the first time really in history that we see um, a flip between these institutions. So we're focusing a great deal of resources on controlling immigration. So one might wonder, well, how well does it work? Okay, so what I'm going to show you here is how many people have been to the border wall? Okay, so a few people. Um, could you cross it? In some parts? Which parts would be easiest to cross? Oh. Sorry. Okay, so if if you haven't been to the border wall, it kind of it, it looks like, like this. This is what you'll see. Most of the extension of it. It's about 2,000 miles, the border between Mexico and the United States. It's where the majority of the spending on, on uh, kind of fortalizing the border has, has been focused on. If you go to the Canadian border, you see more trees than fences. Um, but if you go to the U.S.-Mexico border, you see a wall that's beginning to emerge. It doesn't span the whole 2,000 miles yet. Um, but we do know is it costs about $4 million per mile. So total would be about $8 billion if you were to, to actually complete the wall. Um, and on average, you'll notice that most of the stretches are very barren. They're very rural. Um, they're, they're actually not that hard to cross. And so these aren't members of the ASU climbing team, but <laughs> they were able to get up the fence fairly quickly. Sound effects are wonderful, aren't they? <laughs> okay. So the, the, the wall itself is, is very much symbolic. It's symbolic of efforts to control migration. The question becomes, well, how effective is it? If you could cross it that quickly, um, it's not that effective. If you have border patrol agents at every single intersection, of course, it becomes more effective. And that's true in larger cities like San Diego. Um, but for the largest extent, the largest part of the border, there's actually very little control. There's very little presence of border um, patrol agents, simply because of the cost of maintaining them there. And so the border itself is rather ineffective in stopping people from crossing. But one might wonder, well, what would happen if, if, for example, you were able to man every point on that border, would you perhaps have a more effective border? And so I bring this example in for that reason. This is Anderson Cooper. Um, some people, you, you might enjoy him, you might not. Uh, but the point is really to see where he's going. And so uh, I'm going to kind of fast forward to the video so that, that we don't spend too much time on it. But essentially where he is here is a residential home. Um, he's in Tijuana. And you'll see, you'll be able to see San Diego here from a different vantage point. So he'll look out across to San Diego. So you can see San Diego over on the other side. So it's very close to the border. You see, it looks like a house as you enter in. And you start to notice a few things. There's timber. And you start to see sandbags in the back. Um, the sandbags are, are essentially the dirt that's being pulled out of the tunnel 
and you can't pull if, if you don't want your neighbors this is so this is great if you're looking to build a tunnel make sure you follow these steps accurately um, if you're building a tunnel you don't want to take all the dirt out at once right and so what they do is they bag up the dirt and then slowly one by one or three or four at a time they take the dirt out of the house and so this house still had quite a bit of dirt piled up in the back rooms and then you can see as it goes down into the tunnel it's, it's fairly well reinforced with cinder blocks and then he, he goes into the actual tunnel you see at this point he's actually pointing to the rails which you can't make out too well on the screen but there's actually two rails so, so that there's a cart um, taking drugs and, and things like that across the border is hard if you have to carry it yourself and then you can see he's actually on the cart at this point and within the tunnel there's a storage room uh, within the tunnel for merchandise and then eventually emerges out of the tunnel and into a warehouse um, that's, that's just southeast of San Diego. So you, you can essentially see it's, it's very nondescript. There's some oranges to kind of, you can cover the hole. Um, the hole itself is not very big. You wouldn't really know a tunnel were under there. Uh, so these types of tunnels emerge. It's estimated that these tunnels cost millions of dollars to build. You can imagine, right? You'd have to hire actual miners to put in a tunnel like this. And so um, the fact that someone is willing to put up the cost demonstrates that there's a great deal of money involved within trafficking things across borders. Uh, migrants themselves don't generally come through these. The only types of migrants you see coming through these tunnels are uh, individuals involved in sex trafficking because it's a, it's a, essentially the value of those individuals is much higher for the people trafficking them. Um, people generally that are undocumented cross through the desert, the types of walls that I showed you in the previous film. So one might imagine if enforcement were to go up in those areas in the desert, you might see more people accessing immigration through these means. Of course, the cost for them as an individual will go up, um, but the means are still there. Crossing the border itself is, is not that difficult as it turns out. It's costly, but you can get it done. Okay, so looking at illegal immigration kind of in the history of the United States, recognizing that it's, it's been around for a great deal of time, um, helps us put into context the current debate surrounding illegal immigration. Uh, and within the context of that, we can note that there's a great effort on policing, specifically internally, domestically in the United States. It's one of the first times in history that that focus has really existed. Uh, the Border Patrol itself emerges in the 1920s, so it, it doesn't have that long of a history. And we really don't place emphasis on policing migration internally until the 1990s. And so this is really a, a very recent thing, that, that is the idea of deporting people um, from places other than the border. And so deportations um, have gone up in recent years, and the, the amount of money, of course, that we're spending on that has gone up. So at this point, I'd like to transition to migration theory, look a little more at the, the variables that help us understand why people leave and, and where they go. Okay, so why do people immigrate in the first place? It, it, first, it's important to distinguish between emigration and immigration. Uh, basically, immigration is, is people leaving a country. So people emigrate more often from Mexico than um, they do from the United States. And people immigrate into the United States more frequently than Mexico deals with the issues of immigration. Um, understanding immigration is, is very basic. You can think of push factors over pull, um, or over, you can think of push factors over internal barriers. So push factors are economic factors, social factors, political uh, factors. Economic factors are fairly straightforward. If you're poor, there's lots of inequality within the region in which you live. You might see going somewhere else as an opportunity, and so you might seek out those opportunities. Social, uh, social factors are very clear, especially with the case between Mexico. Where there exist social networks, if you have an aunt or an uncle or someone living in the United States already, you might be more likely to leave. So social networks matter. And political factors matter. Uh, the Guatemalans here in the valley are a good example of that. That is, if there's a civil war, people might be more willing um, or they might be more likely to leave a certain region. And so uh, corruption, uh, repression, um, uh, genocide in the case of uh, Guatemala, uh, those are the types of factors, the political factors that help us understand the conditions under which people leave. Now, internal barriers matter as well. So one might consider one of the staunchest um, one of the largest discrepancies in terms of per capita income in the world is between South Korea and, and North Korea. And yet we don't see that many people migrating from North Korea to South Korea because it's so hard for them to leave. The internal cost of leaving are so high. That is, they know you, they know who you are, they know who your family is, and so they kill you, and they kill your family um, if they're able to catch up with you. But if they're not, they, they will kill your family. And so the internal barriers to emigrating are so high that people tend not to emigrate that much from North Korea, even though we'd expect social and economic factors to, to lead them to do so. Um, immigration, we can understand through pull factors and internal barriers. 
Um, and so the relationship between these two become important. Again, economic factors matter. Immigrants uh, tend to come into the United States and go to economic hubs. They go to places like Chicago, Los Angeles. Um, some come to places like the San Luis Valley, but it's a limited number. Uh, so the economic strength of a region helps us understand where people go. Um, and you can think of the United States as the largest economy in the world, and so largely you, you, or you would expect a lot of immigrants to want to come here. Uh, social factors, there's a great deal of diversity in the United States. There's a lot of social networks, transnational networks already established between countries in the U.S. And so you'd expect that a lot of countries might have natural social networks through which people would try and immigrate to the United States. Um, and then political factors. Uh, the United States has one of the more lenient immigration programs in the developed world. And so that, that might sound as a contradiction to what I've said so far, but it's not. The United States is a country that has pathways for people to come to the United States and actually allows people to become citizens. There are countries like Germany that up until 2004 uh, did not allow individuals that were not born in Germany to ever become citizens. And so there are cases of sixth and seventh generation Turks people coming from Turkey that were not full immigrant or full citizens. They were rather, they were temporary residents or they were um, permanent residents, but they could never obtain a path to citizenship. So within the developed world, the United States has somewhat favorable political conditions compared to other countries. Okay. I'm not sure why those exclamation points, uh, points came through on the left side. <laughs> Apparently, uh, the PC didn't appreciate that I designed this on a Mac. So you can think of the relationship between emigration and immigration and development. And essentially what you see here is that as a country begins to develop, and development you can think of, I'll discuss this more uh, wholly in a second, but development is basically do people have access to healthcare, do they have basic access to education, and do they have access to, to jobs, uh, income. And as development improves, as those three conditions improve, you tend to see very predictable trends in countries. And those trends go as the following. As a country begins developing, so a country like Mexico in the tw early 20th century, as it begins to develop, people actually begin to leave more than they did previously. It turns out you actually need some resources to be able to leave in the first place. And so the poorest of the poor actually are not your immigrants. It's, it's the people who are doing a little bit better than the poorest of the poor. And so you tend to see as countries develop, immigration, uh, immigration out of countries goes up. This is true of South Korea in the 1970s. It's true of Ireland um, in the, the mid 20th century and, and again mid 19th century as well. It's true of places like Italy. Um, you can see this trend. It, it's very predictable as I said. And then there's a threshold. At some point, development reaches a threshold where people say things are okay, and on average, people choose not to immigrate, and immigration levels seem to fall. And then there seems to be a flipping point at which development reaches a high enough point that it becomes an attraction to people from the outside. So the United States has, has kind of always fit this, um, this position in the sense that the U.S. has always been attracting immigrants. Economic has been much stronger than most countries since its beginning. And so you see people coming more frequently to the United States as immigrants and not too many people emigrating outside, leaving the United States. And so in developed countries, you see this type of relationship. In developing countries, you, you can place most developing countries somewhere along here. Uh, so it, it, one might think of Mexico as a net um, emigrator, that is more people leave Mexico than, than they do come into Mexico, which is currently true, but immigration from Guatemala and Central American countries in, in Mexico is actually on the rise. Um, and so at some point we'd actually expect that Mexico will have more immigrants than emigrants. And so um, some important distinctions to, to keep in mind there. Oh, I guess I can't touch that. Okay. So, at currently, about 3% of the world is made up of people that were born in a country uh, that they no longer reside in. So in other words, about 3% of the world is made up of, of immigrants, people living outside of the countries in which they're born. And understanding that is in part understanding the inequalities between countries and the growth of those inequalities over the last 200 years. And so, um, how many people have ever used Gapminder? A few people? My students? Okay, good. <laughs> okay, so Gapminder is awesome. Like I tell my students, you will, you will spend the rest of the night playing with this. Uh, you probably won't, actually. But um, Gapminder is really fun. It, it creates a bivariate relationship. And so you have uh, the access to um, a multitude of variables on both um, the, the Y and the X. And then you also have representation, a data representation points for each of the countries in the world. And so there's roughly 180 points between 180 and, and 200, depending on the years that you choose. Um, some countries you know, break up and due to civil war. Some countries come together. Uh, so that, that shifts a little bit over time. 
But what is true of all these countries is the size of the bubble represents the population. And so you see the red bubble and the blue bubble. Um, this is China, this is India in 1800. They're going to get a lot bigger. Um, the United States is here, and Western European countries correspond to the colors in Europe. Um, you can see Northern Africa, the green, and the Middle East. And then you can see purple is Sub-Saharan Africa. And then you see the Americas, the blue, or the, the yellow. And then you see Asia in red. And so you can start to see the tendencies of countries in terms of development over time um, and how they play out in this basic bivariate relationship. And so here, we're just looking at life expectancy in number of years, so you're expecting how long you're going to live when you're born, the expectant, uh, how long they expect that you would live when you're born, um, and then income per capita. And so what you'll notice is that as income per capita goes up, people tend to live longer. And so um, the other thing I want you to keep in mind is the distance between the United Kingdom and the poorest country, I think, was Angola at this time. Um, you'll notice that the distance is, is very large. That is, if you're Angolan and you could go to the United Kingdom, that would be pretty awesome because your life expectancy and your chances of accessing high income would go up almost instantly, instantly by transferring into um, that new social environment. And so that's the type of relationship that I want you to keep in mind as you watch this. Also, another thing to keep in mind, uh, watch the Middle Eastern countries. You, you'll see them just jump up at a certain moment in time. I'm going to speed up history here. <coughs> Gap miner's fun because it's kind of like being God. <laughs> okay, so this is where we sit as of 2011. You can see jumps. You can see uh, if you look at World War I, for example, you see all countries in the world go boom, right? Their life expectancy drops. That was the Spanish influenza. The Spanish influenza kills more people than all uh, wars combined in the 20th century. And most people aren't aware of it. Um, it killed a lot of people. And you can actually see how that affects the whole world right here on the screen. Um, one of the things that is fascinating to me, as someone who's interested in migration, is the distance between the poorest country and the wealthiest country today. Uh, notice that the distance between those two is about here, and it's three to four times higher. And so notice that the inequalities between countries have actually gone up a great deal during the last 200 years of industrialization and post-industrialization in developed countries. And so we can look at relationships like the United States and Mexico, and you can look at the distance. And so if you look at the United States, per capita income is right over 40, 41. Um, estimated. And then you have Mexico around 11. And so you're, you're almost four times better off on average if you go to the United States. And of course, even if a wall is built between the two, you're still going to see those differences. You're still going to see television. You're still going to see the prosperity that some people have accessed by leaving to the United States before you did. And so you might be likely to find ways to get there even if it becomes very difficult. So you can start to see these differences um, by looking at the US and Mexico. But we can also look at other cases. And so for example, in Argentina, there are a great deal of Bolivians that live in Argentina, that, that go to Argentina looking for work. You can see the economic disparities between Bolivia and Argentina. Um, we can look at, again, I mentioned the case in North Korea and South Korea. Now, if I were living in North Korea, I might want to leave, right? It might be very difficult to because of internal barriers. But nonetheless, the disparities between the two countries, it's almost like living in a different time period, right? Living in North Korea is almost like being in a different, of, of a different era. I also mentioned the case of Germany and Turkey. So you can see the, the difference between Germany and Tur Turkey, and they're, they're right there, right? And so within the European Union, it's very easy to, get with, uh, to cross borders. We expect a lot of people might cross into Germany looking for work. And so the argument that I'm making here is basically, over the last 200 years, the disparities between countries have gone up a great deal. And in a large part, that can help us understand why people are migrating at higher rates today. 
So that, that's basic migration theory. There's a lot more to it, but uh, some of the basic tenets are, are what I just went through. And so keep those in mind as I move into immigration trends for Mexico. Um, who it's immigration trends, are immigration, are, is immigration going up? Are more people coming from Mexico than ever before? Are less people? Um, is, it, is it stagnant? Where do people think it's at? How many people vote for highest ever? Lowest ever? Stagnant? Okay, all right. It's, it's amazing, the, the comparisons with students, right? So many <laughs> fence sitters. Okay, so immigration trends from Mexico. Okay, so if we look at the United States and Mexico, the United States has the largest GDP in the world, so the largest production of services and goods. Uh, the GDP is, China is, is, is quickly moving in on that. Um, Germany is, is very close as well. Um, but not close in terms of, in terms of, of relative uh, growth. The United States is growing slower. Um, China is growing much quicker. But the United States is still several trillion dollars ahead of the closest competitor. Uh, sometimes you'll see the United States is listed as having the second GDP in the world. It's because the European Union, if you combine all the countries within it, have a, a higher GDP. But the United States generally is accepted as having the largest economy in the world. Mexico, surprisingly to many, has the 12th largest economy in the world. And so of all the countries out there, um, on any given day, there's about 200, depending on whether or not countries are breaking up or, or forming together. Um, and, and Mexico is the 12th largest economy in the world. So it has a very large economy, has a very productive economy. Um, but we'll look at the history of population growth in Mexico over the last 100 years, and we'll begin to see why people might be still leaving Mexico, despite the fact that they have a pretty strong economy. GDP per capita, simply dividing GDP by the number of people living in a country. In the case of Mexico, it's, it's about 110 million right now. Um, and you see GDP per capita is 15,300. Um, these are actually updated these last night, so these are 2011. Um, and this is a CI fact book. You can, you can go there, you can compare countries, it's kind of fun. Um, the United States is around 49 point, uh, or 49,800, so almost 50,000. Uh, the difference, of course, is clear. About three and a half times better on average if you were to uh, move into the United States. The Gini coefficient is a simple measure of inequality. It goes from one, it goes from zero to one. One being the most unequal, and so in South Africa, usually it's one of the most unequal countries in the world. Um, Lesbo is, is within South Africa, is actually the most unequal country in the world. Uh, and they're about 0 0.6, 0 0.62, I believe. And so you can think of the United States and Mexico in comparison to them. The more equal countries, the, so that where the distance between the rich and the poor are much closer, uh, the most equal country in the world is Sweden. And it's about, I think it's 0 0.25 or 0 0.23. So you can think of the, the differences on that spectrum. Um, so inequalities aren't that much different between Mexico and the United States. Inequality is still higher in Mexico, though. Uh, but this becomes important. The agricultural sector, sector in Mexico is actually still quite large. About 14% of the people in the uh, employment sector work in agriculture. The United States has a very condensed number of people working in agriculture, but we have a huge agricultural sector. And so we have a mechanized agriculture sector. We have a corporate model of agriculture. And yet we still have the need for people to work in that sector, but there's not many people working in it. And so one might imagine that if you are willing to do the same activities you do in Mexico, um, in terms of if you work in the fields, you might come to the United States where there's a need, there's a dearth of agricultural uh, labor, and, um, and you get paid a lot more. And so uh, we can begin to understand why people would be leaving agricultural areas within Mexico and coming to the U.S. Industry and service, you can see they're somewhat comparable um, in Mexico. You have a pretty high percentage of people working in those sectors in Mexico. And again, if you think of the people working in industry and service, if you're working in Mexico and be getting paid three times less than what you could get paid in the United States and you're talking to your uncle or your friends on the phone and you realize, I could do the same thing and make a lot more money by crossing the border, you too might make that decision. So looking at these comparisons starts to help us understand why people historically might have come from uh, Mexico to the United States. Now this is where the surprise comes. Immigration from Mexico has been falling pretty drastically since the year 2000. And so rates of migration and this is, so about 770,000 individuals came in from Mexico in 2000 um, to the United States. And it's now at about 140,000 per year. And so the, the rates have dropped a great deal. And so understanding why they've dropped uh, kind of leads into to my own research. And so I'll, I'll walk through this a little bit. Um, we see that immigration rates are rising throughout the 1990s. And then they reach a peak in 2000. Um, note that they start to drop pretty drastically uh, the, the actual, the pitch of that drop is, is very steep. And the reason that they're dropping doesn't have much to do with 9-11. So we might think 
the security state starts to rise and after 9-11, um, we start to focus more on the border, securing our borders, and domestically looking at uh, deporting individuals that are undocumented. But that takes several years. There's a backlog. It takes two or three years before that's really implemented. And yet long before that, you see drops in Mexican migration. You see a rise again in 2004. Um, note that this is one of the strongest historic periods of economic production in U.S. history, the, the 2000s. And yet people are not coming as frequently to the United States as they were during the 1990s. And then we see a drastic drop after 2005, um, long before the Great Recession of 2008. So long before economic conditions in the U.S. that would be favorable to people coming change and become much less favorable, we actually see a very steep drop in immigration from Mexico. One could argue this is exactly the time period in which we started spending more on controlling immigration. Therefore, it's working. But if you look at the population trends in Mexico, you begin to see a different picture. And so birth rates in Mexico have, have not been in free fall, as, as this described, but they've been dropping pretty drastically. And so this is 1960 um, to almost to present. You can see fertility rates, so the number of births per woman, and then you can see population growth as an annual percentage. And right now they sit at about two, which is about the same as the United States, about the same as most developed countries. Um, in fact, the United States is now about 1.7 um, uh, births per woman after the, after the 2008 recession. So Mexico is very much, in terms of population, very stabilized and very comparable to developed countries around the world. We can look at this, we can stretch out the timeline a little bit further, and we really can start to understand why during the 1990s and beginning in the early uh, 2000s, people would first come and then stop coming as frequently to the United States. And so here you see death rates in Mexico, and then you see birth rates. And you notice the birth rates peak and, and hold for this, this burgeoning kind of line here, this curve, is holding for a long time period. So really from the 1920s through 1980, you see high birth rates in Mexico. That is, the population is going at a very quick rate. At the same time, people are dying much less frequently. People are living a lot longer. Modern medicine is coming into Mexico. The revolution has stopped. In 1910, the revolution begins. And then by the 20s, right, it's kind of petering out. There's still wars going on through the 19, uh, into the early 1930s. But this, you really can begin to see, population is, is really burgeoning in Mexico during this time period. And so during this time period, you see a huge growth of the Mexican population, which, of course, would be coming of working age right about here. And that's the time period in which we see Mexican migration to the United States grow the most. And so you have a lot of elderly people that need support, and you also have a lot of young people that aren't finding enough jobs within the local sectors. And so you can start to understand uh, why people would be leaving Mexico is specifically during this time period. And then you start to see the rates stabilize and even close together around 2000. And that's precisely where we see the rates drop. Um, so understanding migration rates from Mexico over the last 100 years really asks us to look at population trends. Now, I'll point to the top. Some people have, have probably seen population pyramids. Um, the, the basic idea is that at the top, you have the elderly populations. At the base, you have the youth. Um, and you have on the right females, and on the left, you have males. And so in Guatemala, for example, you get almost a perfect pyramid. That is, the base of the pyramid represents the youth. You have a very young population in Guatemala. You have not that large of an aging population. If you go to the opposite, you can look at Italy. Um, Italy's population pyramid is not a pyramid, right? That's not a, um, a good word to describe it. But you can tell that there's a burgeoning class of people that are about to retire. Um, that large class of people that are about to retire, of course, require a lot of people to take care of them. So it's not surprising that a lot of immigrants that go to Italy actually are working as domestic caretakers. They're working taking care of elderly people in, in Italy. Um, if you look at the United States, we have a, a more stable population. But you can see the baby boomers up here. And if you look at Mexico, you can see that the base of that pyramid has essentially been cut off. That is, population has shifted um, in Mexico. And there's not as many young people as there used to be. And so you can start to understand why people um, were coming over the late 20th century to the United States. So those are immigration trends from Mexico. I want to see where I'm at. OK. On, uh, those are immigration trends from Mexico. Um, I want to look very briefly at some of the uh, current research concerning migration and development. And then I'll get into my own research, and then I'll conclude. So if you look at Mexico, the blue line, this is essentially migration rates. You see again that it, it starts to fall in 2000. And then you have HDI, which is a measure of human well-being. So HDI brings together education, it brings together healthcare, and it brings together access to income. And so where you see HDI rising, 
you, you see essentially Mexico is developing. And so throughout this time period, you see that conditions are getting better in Mexico. And then at the same time, um, this is what I look specifically at in my research, are remittances. And remittances are cash transfers that people send from places like the United States back to Mexico. You can see that they're rising a great deal during this time period. Um, and in fact, at 2000, they continue to go up even though rates of Mexican migration are going down. So people are more established, they have more money, perhaps they're sending more back. Um, so really, what I'm interested in is the relationship that these remittances might have to do with development in Mexico and then subsequently stopping uh, or slowing down migration trends in Mexico. So I'll break into that by looking at the total amount of remittances flowing into Mexico. If you look at the last 10 years, or at least through the 2000s, um, you see that in 2000, Mexican remittances sent back from the United States to Mexico were around $6.5 billion. Um, they peak in 2007 at $26 billion, and they've maintained within the $20 billion range um, through the current year. And so uh, currently we have a lot of money being sent back to Mexico. Um, at the same time, foreign direct investment, so foreign countries um, and their companies investing in places like Mexico is quite frequent. Uh, here's an example. In, here in 2001, Citibank bought the Bank of Mexico, um, and, and that purchase was, I think it was $12 billion. So that's, that's a large influx of foreign money into a country. Foreign direct investment, however, has been outpaced as a percentage of GDP, which you have in parentheses, uh, by remittances. And so there's a larger percentage of Mexico's GDP made up by remittances today than by foreign direct investment. So it's a very important um, transfer, cash transfer. So the research that exists finds the following relationship between immigration and, and these variables. And so um, essentially what I'm looking at here in my own work is the relationship between people leaving and the potential of them sending money back and actually making conditions better in the places from which they've left. And so the idea is, well, do remittances make things better or worse in the places in which uh, people are sending this money? Um, so if $20 billion is being transferred to Mexico, what is the net effect on development? And does it lead to immigration going up or down? So that's the basic, um, the basic question that I'm looking at in my own research. Uh, immigration from Mexico and other places in Africa and the Philippines um, and other parts of America have been found to have a positive effect on income. So in the parentheses, if you see a positive or a negative, you, you'll, you'll essentially know that there's a positive or negative relationship with um, the factor I have here on the left side. If you see an X, it means there's a spurious relationship. So I'll, I'll talk about that further. But um, in the case of income, it's demonstrated that where people leave, income seems to go up uh, because they send money back. And interestingly enough, elections actually, participation in local elections actually go up as well. People seem to talk to their relatives back home. They seem to espouse the, the kind of democratic ideals that they see in the United States. And then their relatives actually become more likely to participate in local elections, which is good for uh, local politics and good for overall development. Um, measures of democracy, accountability and transparency within local governments, for example, uh, in addition to participation in elections, seem to improve where people leave. Um, that is, they seem to transfer back social ideals of, of accountability and transparency, especially from places like the United States. Uh, interestingly enough, there's research in the Philippines that demonstrates that where people leave to places like Saudi Arabia, they actually transfer back accepting ideals of uh, dictatorship. So um, this works both ways. Uh, inequality, it turns out that inequality over time appears to get better where people leave and, and then as they're sending money and, and actually coming back in some cases, inequality improves as well. Um, and then in terms of the overall economy, it seems that as people send money back, it has transfer uh, multiplier effects in local economies. So people start local businesses, people start spending money with the money that they're receiving from abroad in those businesses, and then more businesses grow. So it seems there's multiplier effects within local economies as well. So there's not a lot of research that looks at this, specifically in the case of Mexico, uh, but the potential relationship that I'm interested in in my own research is the potential for remittances, economic growth, and political transition in uh, migrant hometowns to be taking place kind of um, at the same time. And so I'm looking at the potential relationship between these three variables. And okay, my research focuses on Guanajuato, Mexico, which is in the center of Mexico. Some people refer, refer to it as the belly button of Mexico. Um, it's right in the middle of the country. Uh, and it's a case study that I chose because my wife's from there, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll lay that out there first, um, mm -hmm. but also because there is a long history of migration from Guanajuato. Uh, Guanajuato is one of the traditional migrant sending uh, states from Mexico, and it also receives about 
of that 20 billion or so dollars that's sent back to Mexico every year. So every year about 1.5 to 2 billion dollars uh, of money comes from the United States directly into the state. My research concerns the 46 municipalities within the state. I compare across them, and so I look at inequality levels, remittance levels, migration levels, um, and those type of education levels and healthcare uh, factors, and I compare across these areas. And I'm interested in understanding the effect of immigration on those, those factors. And so it turns out to be an interesting place to do this research because of the high amount of remittances, and also because there's an innovative program that started in 2002 called Three for One for Migrants, or Tres por Uno para Migrantes, and I'll, I'll discuss that here um, in, in turn. So Three for One for Migrants is a very interesting program. Migrants essentially in the United States for many years have been forming clubs. And so you can imagine if you left with your uncles and your brothers and other people you knew, you might form clubs and you might send back money um, communally so that you could build bigger projects, right? So instead of just helping grandma or your mother, you might build a road or you might build a house or you might redo a church. And so that's exactly what the government noticed by 2002 that migrants are doing very consistently across the United States is communally sending money back to their hometowns. And so they said, well, why don't we work with the migrants? Why don't we come together and we will share our expertise, engineers, uh, community planners, those types of architects, for example, uh, with migrants so that their projects are more professional and so that they have longer lasting development effects within their small towns. And so what the federal government and the state government, the municipal government offered to the migrants is they said, if you do communal projects of this type, and so if you're interested in building roads and electricity grids and bridges and community centers and schools, we will put in three times what you put in. And so if you put in $10,000, we each will put in $10,000. It becomes essentially three for one. So a $10,000 project becomes a $40,000 project, $100,000 project, uh, project becomes a $400,000 project. And all of this, once the migrants and the government agree on a project, goes to a committee, the COVAM, and they, government officials and migrants together, decide whether or not to approve that project for the next year. And so this offers me a very interesting opportunity because I can compare the effect of just cash transfers from individual to individual with this more communal form of remitting money from one migrant club in the United States to a whole town in Mexico. And so the idea becomes to compare across those. And I'll relate all this back to um, the story of, of migration trends in a second. So to give you guys an idea of what this looks like on the ground, Jorge Martinez is one of the first people I contacted. Um, he actually lives in Albuquerque. He's been uh, working at the same restaurant on Central, for those of you that have been to um, Albuquerque. He's been working at the same restaurant since 1991. He uh, has been remitting money since then, since he came to the United States. Um, he's now a citizen. He was a resident before. There was a time period in which he was an undocumented immigrant. Um, but through that whole time period, he's been sending money back, about 10% or so of his check to, to Mexico. Um, to help his mom, to help his brothers. And he, towards the end of the 1990s, decided to start doing larger projects. And so he actually, by himself, with, he, well, with him and, him and his, his cousins, he went to the local town, which is down here. He threw a bunch of gravel into the back of his truck and then went back to his hometown. This is Jerequero, his town. And he started building a road by himself. Who's ever built a road? Yeah, me either. You've, you've built a road, oh my gosh. Um, I didn't think anyone said yes to that. So um, some people have built roads. I never built a road. Um, roads, it turns out, are, they take a little bit more than you would think. And so building an actual road and making it effective over a long time period takes expertise, it takes engineers. And so the local, um, the local representative said, hey, Jorge, why don't we do this together? And, and he said, no, I don't, I don't really trust you. He didn't say that to him directly, but that's what he um, confided in me. He said, I, I don't trust the local officials, and so I built my road by myself. The road was not very effective, had lots of potholes, and so the individual called him. He was in the United States, he was back, and he, the official called him and he said, Jorge, why didn't you go talk to the Mexican consulate and try this three for one program? And so he's, he finally said, okay. He went to the Mexican consulate on 4th Street in Albuquerque, he talked to the uh, individuals, he rounded up $10,000 calling immigrants from his hometown all across the nation, places like Nebraska and Texas and California, and he took that money, he took it to the consulate, and they started a project. And since then, they built three roads. And so um, accessing the three for one program has allowed him to be more effective in his desire to improve his hometown. So, so this is the case of, of Jorge. There's many different forms of remittance-led development. These are, this is one road, for example, that was built. Um, this is actually Jorge's house, which I was um, lucky enough to stay in. As you know, I went to South Fork and noticed the mansions that people live in for two weeks a year. Yeah, well, this exists in Mexico too. Um, but Mexicans that send money back, they built houses. And for them, right, coming from the humble position in which they left, 
um, a two-car garage and a two-story house is, is literally a mansion. And so when you walk into these small towns, these houses stand out. And oftentimes there's not people living in them because the people that own them are working in the United States. So lots of houses are built, churches are rebuilt. Um, you can see that there's, there's a great deal of money that was put into that. Um, so the cultural norms that people have, they often invest in. So these are the types of development projects that take place along with others that I listed. And this is a factory, and so there's some productive forms. This is another town, um, and it's a textile factory. So they produce, they produce uh, like bathrobes, um, and I think now they're producing more uh, jeans and, and things of that nature. And so um, the, essentially this migrant group, uh, the project was a $240,000 number, I think the total investment, uh, and the idea was to bring more employment to that hometown. And so there's, there's a variety of different types of projects. I look at a number of different variables. I'll explain them in kind as I look at the models. Um, but if, if anyone wants to come back to this, please let me know. So this is the basic expectations that I had going into this research. My thoughts were remittances by themselves, so cash transfers from individual to individual, someone living in the United States, sending money back to someone living in Mexico, I thought would have the following effects across municipalities in, Mex in, in Guanajuato. I thought it would improve healthcare. I thought people have cash coming in. If they're sick, they'll probably use that to access healthcare. Um, they will probably use it to also help individuals with their education. And so if, if a child needs education, uh, needs school um, utilities, uh, things like crayons and, and paper, basic things that you need to go to school, uniforms, um, you, you might see education improve in Mexico as a result of remittances. And also that income would improve. That seemed natural, right? People get more cash, their income improves. I thought elections, because of the current research, um, might improve. People might participate more in local elections. I didn't think it would have, I thought it would be a spurious relationship or a, a non-existent relationship with remittances and democracy. I just, I didn't buy into the idea that cash transfers would improve accountability or transparency. And I thought, in general, as people send money back, people would be probably better off, and so they might be less likely to migrate in the first place. Um, with the 3 for 1 program, so investments made through this program, I thought municipalities where you see more of these types of investments, I thought healthcare would improve because there are investments in healthcare uh, units. There are also investments in education centers, so I thought education might improve. I didn't think income would improve in the short run. I'm looking at a 10 year period here, um, and so 10 years over 46 municipalities, so I'm looking at about 460 data points, and I just didn't think that was a long enough time period to really account for the possible impact of this program on income. I thought the infrastructure, bringing electricity grids and bringing new schools, I thought maybe over 20 or 30 years that might have an effect, a positive effect on income, but in the short run I just didn't think it would. Um, in terms of elections, I thought as people see locals working with state officials, they might be more likely to be vested in the, 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 in the local political um, system and therefore they might participate more often in elections. And then I also thought that might bode well for democracy. That is, transparency and accountability of local governments might improve as a result of this. And then in terms of migration, I thought overall, because development's getting better, I felt that, that people might migrate less frequently. And so again, that, that becomes the most important variable, which I'll tie back into the overall presentation. Um, given the fact that I've already gone through an hour, I, I want to go straight to the, the overall results and then leave time for discussion as well. So, the results were essentially this. I found that remittances had a negative effect on healthcare. That is, I actually found that remittances as they went up in the previous year led to worse healthcare outcomes in the next year. And I found that the same effect existed with education. That is, as people started sending more money back to municipalities, education actually fell. Education outcomes fell in the next year. I found the income improved, it's cash transfers, and so that naturally seemed to be taking place. Um, people participated far less in elections. They actually stopped participating um, to degrees of 5 to 10 percent drops in, in actual elections. Um, measures of accountability and transparency dropped. Um, and so where you see more cash transfers at municipal levels, you actually see less quality or lower quality of democracy. And migration went up. People started leaving more frequently. And so uh, many of my expectations were actually proven wrong. And I, I found that overall, Remittances seem to have kind of a vicious uh, effect on local municipalities. In contrast, I found that where three for one investments are much higher, um, in the ensuing years, you see healthcare improve, you see education improve, income, like I predicted, it was spurious, there was no uh, relationship, but you see people participating more often in elections, and you see transparency and accountability of local governance improve and you see migration go down. And, and that became one of the most important findings for me, is that as you see people 
find meaningful ways to participate in local development through this three for one program at the municipal level, you actually saw less people leaving in ensuing years. And so tying it back into the overall presentation, it seemed that getting people involved in development and really channeling these remittances towards meaningful development ends led to migration going down. Um, and so you kind of see a virtuous cycle uh, in which development improves, less people leave, and the community overall is much better. Uh, in general, again, my expectation is that as I expand this data set, um, I, assuming I live 10 more years, as this data set grows to 20 years, I, I would assume that over time I would see a positive effect on income. That is, as these development levels um, in, continue to improve, if they do, one might expect that employment opportunities and income would improve as well. So to summarize kind of the, the whole presentation, um, briefly I looked at the history of immigration in the United States. This, this concept of illegal immigrants is something that um, has been renegotiated time and time again. Currently we're within a period of reform. We're talking about whether or not we should deport people, whether we should accept them as citizens, um, whether or not we should label them as illegal immigrants, um, conditional residents or full citizens, um, and whether or not they should have a path to any of those uh, aforementioned categories. Uh, and one of the questions that I've always had looking at this issue is what effect would it have anyways? Would people continue to come? It turns out that even in Germany, as I mentioned, where people were eighth generation Turks but never considered full citizens, they continued to come despite the fact that they weren't full citizens. And so in looking at migration theory and looking at migration trends in Mexico, it seems to me that the only reasonable way to actually control migration is to find meaningful ways to contribute to development in migrant sending regions. And so I, I found this quote, and I'll let people just read through it. it. It's a large quote, but I think it's worth reading. And then I'll refer back to it. So people might wonder, where does this come from? Um, in 1986, there was an immigration reform. It was, it was the last immigration amnesty, as it referred to, a reform since the one that now is being debated in Senate. And IRCA, as it was referred to, or the Immigration Control Reform and Control Act, uh, basically provided about two million people with residency and then a path to citizenship. And so it was referred to as an amnesty. Uh, it was the last one. It was the last uh, phase in which we saw an actual reform of, of that type. And we're currently going through the same types of debates within the Senate. This is a Senate report, the Commission for the Study of International Migration and Cooperative Economic Development, that Senate and Congress asked for after IRCA. So they passed IRCA in 1986, and this is the conclusion they came to. That the only way to officially or meaningfully control migration is to contribute to meaningful development in the countries from which people come. And so it's, it's not something that's hidden to the government. It's not something that we're not aware of. It's something that is very well documented. Um, but it's interesting that the way in which we debate these things, uh, it is as if this research didn't exist. And so we, we discuss immigration as if building a wall or as if stopping people from coming or deporting them would actually stop the results that, that we think are, are negative within local communities. And yet the government's very clear on the fact that the only way to control it is to actually contribute to sustained development and growth in the regions from which people come. And so I refer back to this. Um, again, the case of Mexico helps us understand this quite well. As development takes place, immigration goes up. As it gets to a threshold, it starts to fall. And then eventually, there, there seems to be a point where countries become net immigrators. Uh, Mexico is at, the, at that threshold. It's at that point where immigrants coming from Guatemala in Central America are at the point that at some point in the near future they will overcome or they will overtake the number of people leaving Mexico. And so Mexico itself is now dealing with this issue. One of the most fortified borders in uh, the Americas is actually Guatemala and Mexico. So if you ever get a chance to go down there, it's interesting to, to look at that particular border. Um, and there's been a shift. That is, there are people that leave Central America and they want to get to the United States, but a lot of them end up working in Cancun, Monterrey, Ciudad de México, DF, um, and other places with large economies throughout Mexico. So I refer back to this in my conclusion. Again, in my opinion, in many experts' opinion, the only meaningful way to, to control migration is to actually close the gap between these countries and the countries you see here on the right-hand side. Um, making meaningful advancements in, develop, in terms of the development of these countries, which up to here um, have about 80% of the world's population, 
uh, but about 20% of its worth uh, or, or wealth. And then this side of the equation, which has about 80% of the wealth, but 20% of the people, closing that gap would be the best way to control migration. So that's my talk. Uh, I'd like to open up the floor to discussion and to questions. Um, and and that's, that's that. So thank you. Yeah, I'm ready. And in your studies, were there any of the 46 municipalities of Guanajuato that were not interested in participating in this phase that over? So at some point in the 10-year period in which I looked at, all municipalities participated in the program. Uh, there's, there's very much kind of a, a political um, component to this as well. So if, if I go back to... So in, in one of the data runs that I did, my dependent variable on top of three for one investment. So I was interested here in understanding, well, where do three for one investments take place? And what I found is remittances have to be present within municipalities for this program to work. After all, it's about channeling remittances. So remittances had a positive relationship with this. Return migrants did as well. One of the most important factors, actually, in my research um, are these return migrants, people that come to the United States and then decide to go home. And it turns out that they, they seem to transfer a lot of good things, uh, ideas about democracy, ideas about local development, and, and also wealth. And so they bring back money that can be invested in the local community. Um, one of the most important predictors, however, was pre-election years. And so in the years ensuing an election, there were many more investments um, through the 3 for program, mm -hmm. which means essentially, so I lagged this variable by a year, and it, it ident eventually, you, you kind of come to the conclusion through local interviews and, and this data result that politicians are very much interested in projects coming out about the time that their parties can be up for re-election. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that as a negative thing that is true only in corrupt countries, uh, but it's very true in the United States as well. Sure. So um, it, it seems to be the nature of the way in which we do develop. That is, every three or four years, we care about it looking good. Um, and then, then we wait for two or three years so that we can stack it all um, right before an election. So um, politicians also play a role in timing these events. And so to get back to your question, it seems to me uh, that all municipalities are very interested in this program. One, because it, it triplifies the, the effect of the right migrant remittances. It brings in federal transfers that they otherwise wouldn't get. Um, but also because it, it seems to, in some ways, be used to, to help with local elections. So I'm, I'm not sure if that clearly answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, the three for one program, I mean, it, it sounds wonderful, but I guess my question is, where is the money coming from, and is there any correlation between that and the, um, the data that shows the, the, the gap between the rich and the poor in our own country, in other words, at the expense of the United States middle class, funding these types of things and other foreign aid programs and all the political implications of that? Okay. So let me, I think there's two phases to your question. Um, do, do remittances hurt the middle class in the United States? Is, no, the three no. for one, where's the funding coming from? The, the three okay. for one so, in the United States, and is it correlated to the data, the, tw the one graph that showed the, the, I mean, maybe I'm blind, but it seems no, to no. me the middle class is shrinking in our country. Oh, yeah, no, no, you're most certainly, yeah. you're, you're not blind. Um, that's true. Um, in, in the case of the three for one program, funding comes from migrants living in the United States. And so they, through their earnings, decide. Right, but we match. No, 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 no that, those are, that's federal, municipal, and state governments in Mexico. Okay, yeah. I, I, I apologize for the confusion. I missed that point. Yeah, so that's, okay. that's, uh, that's coming from federal but transfers. But we are investing in a lot of foreign aid. <laughs> no, in the United States, yes. Yeah. The United States invests in foreign aid, most certainly. Um, there's USAID, so the, the Agency of International Development. Um, there is the World Bank, which the United States is, is the largest contributor to. Um, there's the IMF, same story. Uh, there's a great deal of international aid that the United States uh, participates in. Um, of course, given the free, or well, not free, but the, the low cost of our garments and stuff that come from uh, regions in which uh, these individuals are producing our goods, you know, I think that's only fair that we send a little bit of aid back, but that's a different story. Yeah. Have you done any exploration of internal migration? In, in, you know, within the data set that I look at, I, I'm not able to tease that out. Um, within Mexico, there's, 
So some of the individuals that I interviewed, for example, um, Jorge, so going back to the, the individual that I did bring into the presentation, he went to Mexico City first and lived with his brothers. Uh, he left, he came, he came back to his town for two years, his brothers then moved on to the United States and he followed them to Albuquerque. So um, a lot of times, both in, in Mexico, uh, I've also done research in Costa Rica um, concerning people living in Nicaragua and coming to Costa Rica to work. Uh, there's about 18%. So. In the United States, 14.7% is the high point in 1910 of, of our population in terms of percentage made up by immigrants. Um, we're at about 14% today. So about 14% of our population is made up of immigrants today. Costa Rica currently has 18% of its population made up of Nicaraguans alone. Um, you had Panama and Colombia and other countries in there. and It, it has a huge immigrant population, ranging around 25% of the population. Um, in both Mexico and Costa Rica, I've noticed that internally the people I talk to tend to go first to, so in the case of Nicaragua, Managua, um, the, the main large city, or Granada, they work in tourism, and then they jump to, to Costa Rica. In the case of Mexico, very similar. People to go, seem to tend to go to larger cities first, and then jump to the United States. Um, and a lot of people simply end up staying in those big cities. So there's some great work, uh, um, Cornelius, who, Wayne Cornelius, who was working at uh, the University of San Diego, his dissertation in the 1970s was on internal uh, migration in Mexico. And he wrote on the squatters communities in uh, Mexico City. And, and it's very clear that the growth of Mexican cities, so Mexico City is estimated to be about, I think it's 22 million people right now. Um, and, and a lot of that growth is attributed to internal migration. But, but it's not a focus of mine, so. I was just curious, are there the same kinds of driving forces uh, drive internal migration as well as external? Yes, I, I think most well, certainly you could think of Mexico City as an external place in which um, the, the things that pull them are strong economies, social networks, and, and politics. So. Not dissimilar from this country in that regard. Not at all. No, no not at all. If you were to put on your procrastinator sombrero, what would, uh, how, how effective or e verify be in all this? So, how, how would it affect the, the outcome of this type of situation? So, um, so I don't have a sombrero, but right? um, I do at home, I should have it. Um, the, so there's a number of things that I didn't discuss. Uh, one of the things that is very true is that in my research, I found that return migrants have one of the strongest effects on meaningful development within the towns in which they leave. When you build walls and you make people verify um, their ID, People are not less likely to come to the United States, but they're much less likely to go back. Um, that is, because it becomes so difficult to get back into the United States, people tend to stay. And so they'll stay for 10, 15, 20, 30 years without ever having gone back home. And so once they get citizenship or residency, they might go back home. But here's the problem in this whole equation. If you are going back to your hometown frequently, you have meaningful commitments to that town. You'd be more likely to contribute to local development. If you don't get to go back for 20 or 30 years, you might go back once in a while and say hi to aunts and uncles, but that's probably it. You wouldn't contribute to meaningful development within those, those towns. And so um, as immigration control goes up in the United States and it's more difficult for people to leave, one would expect, I would expect, and other experts expect, um, that these types of programs would have less meaningful results. Because of the debate going on in our country right now, if we were all U.S. Um, Congress members, mm -hmm. what's the take-home message from this, from your research that we should be thinking about? So, I think there's a number of take-home messages, right? Um, one, I think Congress is, is very aware, or at least the, the research commissions that they've had in the past, as I demonstrated, seem to be aware of the fact that meaningful development is really the best way to control migration. That said, as congressmen and congresswomen, all of you have constituents, right? And all of your constituents live in different places. Constituents might come from a place like Arizona. Uh, my presentation shouldn't be taken in the wrong light in the sense that um, I'm not arguing that there are not real problems with migration in the United States and immigration in the United States. Uh, if you're from parts of southern Arizona, uh, as people, millions of people cross through your land or through your cities and route to other places, um, or other goods, so trafficking of, of uh, for example, drugs um, tends to go more frequently through Arizona now as well because it's, it's the weaker point of the border. 
Um, those are real issues, and those are issues that constituents are dealing with and pressuring politicians to deal with. And so even though as a politician it might be transparent to you, as I think it is to many politicians, that the best way to control migration in the long run is meaningful development, I think in the short run, um, politics urges you or pushes you, if you want to get reelected, to make um, meaningful symbolic uh, contributions to your uh, constituents and, and walls and, and um, e-verify and other things of that sort uh, fulfill that. So people see a commitment, <coughs> and therefore, if if you're coming from a um, if you're coming from a district in which uh, they want someone that's hard on immigration, those type of things will get you reelected. In the game of getting reelected, that's the business of politics. Um, that becomes your business. So. Be interesting to see your research as it applies to. Um, the communities that the migrants went to, like the yeah. impact on economic, you know, I guess I lived here when the Guatemalans came in, mm -hmm. and as a healthcare provider, we were so unprepared yeah, on how sure. to take care of them well, and um, so what's that, and I think that's part of that debate here is, mm -hmm. you know, but how if we enriched our community because of that too, I mean, right. there's just, yeah. there was all that up front, you know, oh man, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> you don't even know how to communicate with this group of people who come here. Who, but then you look at the the plate of you know. There's I just saw some data recently that for every plate of food, you know, like three fourths of it comes from from migrants. You yeah. know, and um, and then we throw forty percent on average out. But. You, you know, so so it'd be interesting to see these data points. The from the U.S. Here. side. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, the large percentage of uh, my data is actually compiled uh, from from the Mexican government. Um, I do use some U.S. Census data. The largest percentage, however, comes from Mexico. Um, because it's a billion dollar industry for men's is coming back, uh, the government pays a lot of attention to tracking it. And so it, there's great data on the Mexican side. On the U.S. side, because people are undocumented, um, it makes it very difficult to, to actually have good data on these things. So it's very difficult to know where people are, where they came, where they went, where they're going. Um, the Center for Immigration <coughs> Studies, uh, and I, I could send you the link if you ask me to afterwards, has a, a, a lot of uh, research that comes out on this. But they have a, a recent publication that is specifically on the cost of um, undocumented immigrants in the United States. And one of the most interesting findings, I think, was um, immigrants on average, it, it seemed to they estimated they contribute about $10,000 to the system, and they cost the system about 13, so there's a net loss of three. Um, people within that same demographic of undoc undocumented immigrants in the United States cost the government, but people that have citizenship in the United States that fit those same demographics, cost the US about $10,000 per person. So, I mean, you can look at it from, from different sides. Those are, of course, estimates. Again, it's difficult to have good data on, on undocumented individuals. Are you familiar with all the research on the economic impact of immigration on African Americans? In, so, um, I'm always fascinated by the South. My grandma's from the South, and so uh, she lives in a nursing home that is made up in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, of all white people. Um, and then the only time I see Hispanics or, or black people is when I uh, go to get my lunch with her. And I'm always fascinated by that. I'm fascinated that, you know, 100 and some years after, um, after the Civil War, we, we still have this major segregation in the South. So there's a, a lot of research that has recently started to emerge from the South because traditionally immigrants from Mexico specifically, but other parts of Americas, of the Americas, uh, Central America and South America, go to California, they go to Texas, they go to places like Colorado, the Southwest essentially, um, and Chicago. And those individuals have started going to specifically the South. Um, and they work in Tyson chicken plants. They work in the industries um, of agriculture, for example. Um, in Georgia, for example, when they passed the, the recent immigration bill, I think it was in 2011 or 10, um, they lost millions and millions of dollars because essentially people weren't showing up to the field because they're so fearful of getting caught and deported. So they went elsewhere. So Georgia's reported, um, I think over the years, it's now billions of dollars of losses in agriculture. Um, and now the U.S. government is, of course, subsidizing those losses uh, at the federal level to those farmers. So that's an interesting cost as well. In terms of the effect on African Americans, uh, there, there does seem to be some not so latent anymore conflicts and tensions between Hispanics and African Americans in the South. Uh, you see this in education systems, um, so within high schools and uh, primary and secondary schools, and you also seem to see it within the workforce. And so uh, th there seems to be a real, uh, real issue there. It's, it's not my expertise, and it's not a field that I've read too much into, but I know that there are tensions that you're, as you're referring to. Well, I know in the post Katrina, New Orleans. Um, <coughs> Hispanic workers basically have, have taken over a in lot of that yeah. construction. In Katrina, yeah. 
Um, one of the things that's true about Hispanic workers and undocumented workers in general, um, it's actually important to note that uh, right now, for a long period of time, last 20 years or so, Hispanics have made up the largest percentage of migration, or growth of migration. Um, in the last three or four years, Asians actually um, now are the fastest growing migrant group in the United States. But undocumented immigrants in general uh, are much more mobile. And so if, if there's a disaster like Katrina, the first people that can pick up and leave and um, go to work are, are Hispanic workers. And so um, being much more mobile, having less ties to family, um, being able to pick up and essentially um, leave immediately and start work the next day uh, means that these individuals in those types of instances uh, tend to move in quite quickly. We have time for one more question. Yeah, just to do a clarification, the three for one program, is yeah. that just in the state of Guanajuato or is that nationwide it's, throughout it, Mexico? It's now nationwide. It began in Jalisco, it began um, in Zacatecas, Jalisco, Guanajuato, and in Michoacán, and now it's it's in all 32 entities in the federal district as well. Um, if, if you're interested in much more information, I could you know, connect you with them, the people that can tell you about it. Um, Mexican consulates are the best place to, to learn about it. I'd like to thank you all for coming. Um, and again, if you are, want to be on our mailing list, um, it's up here. And let's thank Dr. Waddell one more time.